Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. My name is Julie Hook from the Integrated HIV AIDS Planning Technical Assistance Center, or the IHAP TAC. Thank you for joining our webinar today on Integrated Planning 101. This webinar will describe the five optimal stages of integrated planning and introduce lessons learned, best practices, and resources for the integrated planning process and development of integrated plans. During the webinar, my JSI colleagues, Molly Tasso and Devin Brown, will define and describe integrated planning, provide the rationale for integrating HIV prevention and care planning, and walk through the five stages. Throughout the webinar, we'll incorporate examples from jurisdictions and highlight available resources to assist jurisdictions in their integrated planning work. I hope you're familiar with the IHAP TAC, but if not, we began, um, we were HRSA funded um, and began in 2016 to support Ryan White HIV AIDS program Part A and Part B recipients and their respective planning bodies and councils with their overall integrated planning efforts and implementation and monitoring of their plans, integrated plans. The current project period extends through 2023, and we provide both national and targeted technical assistance and training activities. The IHAP TAC is led by JSI along with our partner, Health HIV. After this webinar, we hope that you'll be able to describe the five optimal stages of integrated HIV prevention and care planning, describe at least one best practice for developing integrated plans, and identify at least one resource to help support integrated planning efforts and the development of future integrated HIV prevention and care plans. The jurisdictions, we know that you have a lot of different initi initiatives going on that are guiding HIV prevention and treatment efforts. While we know inter integrated planning can feel like just one more thing to add on, it's a process that hopefully can ease implementation of other initiatives. So let's take a look at how integrated planning can support other initiatives. But before we start, we just wanted to acknowledge that we're delivering this webinar in the midst of a public health crisis. We know health departments are on the front line and are in the midst of re responding to the current cases, cases and surges. We thank you for the work you're doing and for joining us today. Also, the work of integrated planning has certainly changed within the context of COVID-19, and we've done our best to highlight that throughout the webinar. But as we go through today's presentation, please chat us with the unique, any unique COVID-related challenges that have arisen, including any solutions you've developed while conducting community planning in the context of COVID. I'm sure most people know the uh, CDC and HRSA first released the guidance in 2015 to support the submission of an integrated prevention and care plan. The National HIV AIDS Strategy, or NHAS, continues to guide all the national efforts and integrated planning is designed to accelerate progress towards reaching the four NHAS goals and strengthen its performance along the HIV care continuum. Because NHAS serves as a roadmap for all that we do, the goals continue to guide integrated planning and will inform the development of the integrated HIV prevention and care plans for 2022 and tw through 2027. In addition, the Ending the HIV Epidemic Initiative will also help to achieve the NHAS goals. Integrated planning is a way for jurisdictions to demonstrate how to coordinate government-funded services, reconcile different planning efforts, including the EHE plans, and align funding streams to meet national and local goals. Guidance for the upcoming integrated HIV prevention and care plans has been postponed due to the COVID-19 emergency. The news was outlined in a June 2020 letter from HRSA and CDC program leaders. The letter explains that the expected release of the guidance will be delayed, and HRSA and CDC in that letter also outline expectations for continued use of integrated plans and encouragement for uh, refinement of ongoing planning, incorporation of EHE plans, and community engagement. The letter also acknowledged that many, uh, many jurisdictions um, have developed their EHE plans that were required as part of the EHE initiative funding from CDC and may be in the process of refining um, those activities now. We encourage you to incorporate your community engagement for the EHE plans and your integrated planning activities to the extent that it is helpful. The Integrated HIV Prevention and Care Plan is the umbrella plan for all of your HIV-related resources and activities, and the EHE plan should work in conjunction as a subset of focused resources and activities. So while we wait for the release of the new guidance, the IHAP TAC is still here and available to help provide technical and training assistance around integrated planning 
um, we're able to help with lots of different things, including integrated planning activities, engaging community and community planning and integrated planning efforts, aligning the care plans with other initiatives, implementing monitoring your plans, and optimizing resource allocation methodologies. So first, we just want to talk about sort of why integrate HIV prevention and care planning. Um, it sounds like a lot of effort. So, what are sort of the benefits, and what are the what are the what are the ways to uh, approach um, integrating intervention and, and uh, prevention and care? So, the integrated planning process requires communication within jurisdictions to ensure the accurate identification of need inclusion of stakeholders and development of efficient and comprehensive approach to HIV prevention and care coordination. Integrated planning process represents a collective effort across a variety of stakeholders, including people with HIV, those that are vulnerable to HIV, service delivery providers, state, local, and tribal authorities, and other community members to prioritize and coordinate thoughtful HIV prevention and care treatment approaches. Jurisdictions document the data and strategies identified through the planning process and their integrated prevention and care plans. Successful integrated planning can result in what you see outlined on the current slide, including supported a more coordinated, creative, and efficient approach to providing HIV and prevention treatment services. And an essential piece of successful integrated planning relies on relationship building, especially with stakeholder and consumer groups. Now I'd like to turn the presentation over to um, my colleague, Devin. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is Devin, just as Julie said, delighted to be here to um, present to you all today. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what do we mean by integration. Um, so before we look more closely at what integration actually means, I want to be clear about um, the integrated planning process versus the integrated HIV prevention and care plan itself. So the integrated planning process brings together HIV prevention and care priorities and includes activities required for integrated plan development, the details of which um, will be different for each jurisdiction. Later on today, we'll specifically look at the five stages of the integrated planning process um, that Julie kind of mentioned earlier. The integrated HIV prevention and care plan consists of a jurisdiction's proposed approach to, to integrating HIV prevention and care service delivery and should be related to the intended outcomes identified in the planning process. So while the contents of the integrated HIV prevention and care plan will be directed by HRSA and CDC guidance, the approach to integrated services will be determined by each jurisdiction. Likewise, integration does not look the same across jurisdictions and can happen in different ways, including across HIV and other infectious diseases. So as we go through the different ways that jurisdictions can conduct their integrated planning process, um, we ask, you know, start thinking about which pieces apply to your context. So now, what do we actually mean when we talk about integrated planning activities? What does that look like? Um, as you can see on the slide here, um, integration can take place across several domains that include planning groups, planning activities, physical integration, um, integrating recipient staff and procurement. We'll look more closely at each domain in just a few minutes. In addition to occurring across different domains, integration can also occur across a spectrum within each domain, ranging from no integration to full integration. Remember, there's no single or you know, right way for integration to look. That said, we all know how important measurement is in ensuring movement toward a goal. To help with that process, the IHAPTAC developed an instrument that measures progress toward integration across multiple domains. Um, it was piloted with eight Brian White Part A and Part B recipients, um, and the revised tool will be included in a forthcoming needs assessment launching sometime next month. So let's take a closer look at the different ways that integration can happen within organizational procurement and planning buckets, ranging from no integration to full integration. We've got a graphic here to help kind of illustrate what we're talking about. So here's some examples of how integration can occur within um, an organizational structure, and that includes communication, data sharing, and or structure and leadership. We know this may not be really easy to read right now, but um, we have the slides available. I believe we chatted them out earlier um, on our website, so you are more than welcome to look more closely at this on your own. The point we really want to emphasize here is that integration does not look the same for everybody. As we said, 
there's no one size fits all approach. Um, and this slide along with the next two really exemplify that. So this slide describes how integration could occur within the procurement domain, sorry, procurement domain. And then this next one um, describes some ways in which integration can occur within the planning bucket. So integration can take place within planning body structures, um, the decision or priority setting process, resource allocation, and or the special initiatives planning process. And now I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Molly. Great. Thank you so much, Devin. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Molly Tasso. I'm a member of the IHAP TAC team. Um, and I'm going to start um, today uh, by talking a little bit about uh, the models of integrated planning. Um, so circling back to sort of what we discussed earlier, integrated planning doesn't only mean one fully unified or merged uh, prevention and care planning body. And it's really important that we recognize that a fully uh, merged planning body really may not be feasible for, for all jurisdictions, nor is it really the only ideal approach to integrated planning. This is truly not a one size fits all. So we um, really just want to underscore that point. So because of that, we really encourage jurisdictions to explore different types and different levels of integration to determine which model really best suits their needs and to think about integration as an ongoing process. Um, so the level um, of integration can be intensified over time um, and can be sort of built upon. So there's really no need to rush uh, the process. So here are five different types um, generally of integrated planning models that a jurisdiction can pursue. And again, this is not an exhaustive list of all models or planning activities, um, but just kind of is here to give you a sense of the options um, that you can pursue if, if you haven't already and you're curious about um, exploring some of these, um, of these options. So I'm going to walk through quickly a general description and also provide an, uh, an example, either real or hypothetical, of what each of these look like in practice. So the first type of, and uh, this is really a sort of integrated planning activity, not so much a model, but it's just uh, based on basic information sharing. So understood here as a situation in which each planning body informs the other planning body of their work, either using presentations, reports, webinars, conference calls, or other maybe more informal communication activities. In uh, practice, this might mean a representative from a local HIV prevention group attends a Part A planning council or planning body meeting and provides a report on issues impacting HIV prevention services statewide and nationally. So the second uh, model is something we call cross-representation. And this is where one or more members of each planning body actually serve as members of the other body. So as you can see in this graphic, you have the red and the blue planning bodies, um, which operate separately, but then one person in the middle, which is colored yellow, serves on both. And so that person can act as a sort of liaison um, and facilitate communication. In practice, um, this might take shape in the form of an HIV prevention group representative or a Ryan White Part B representative serving as a member um, on a Ryan White Part A planning council. Um, and for example, in Massachusetts, they have established cross-representation between the Boston Ryan White Part A Planning Council and the Massachusetts Integrated Prevention and Care uh, Committee. So that's a great example to look to. Uh, third, the next option is a, an integrated information gathering and or data analysis. So this is a situation where care and prevention planning bodies engage in data-based collaboration through joint activities. So this might um, include needs assessment activities, evaluations, consumer input activities, analysis of HIV care continuum data, or service planning and strategy development being done together jointly um, as a singular group. So in practice, uh, this may take the shape of a joint work group that includes prevention and care representatives 
that are responsible for designing and, and implementing a needs assessment or developing the EPI profile for both the state and maybe a Part A jurisdiction. And it may also involve uh, an HIV prevention planning group representative participating in the development of a Ryan White statewide coordinated statement of need, which is a, uh, a required component of the integrated uh, HIV prevention and care plan. So to just put a fine point on it, um, we can look to Ohio, where in 2018, the Ryan White Part A and Part B programs in the Ohio Department of Health HIV Prevention Program, uh, they began conducting a multi-year joint statewide needs assessment targeting both Ohioans at risk for infection and also individuals living with HIV. So fourth, um, the, the next model uh, involves the development of an integrated committee of a larger planning body. So with this type of planning structure, there's a standing committee on a larger planning body that carries out collaborative planning tasks for both prevention and care. So as an example, um, this may include a Ryan White Part A planning council establishing a standing prevention committee or a joint program committee. Um, and in Houston, the Part A planning council gives a great example. They have, uh, they've established an early identification of individuals with HIV work group which includes members of the Part A Planning Council, but also the Houston Prevention Planning Group. So together they work on this early identification strategy. And then uh, last we have um, the idea of a unified prevention and care planning body. So um, some jurisdictions may decide to pursue this, um, and it's characterized by a single statewide or Part A planning body responsible for carrying out both prevention and care um, planning activities. Um, and uh, we can, this may take the, the shape of an advisory body housed within a state department of health that is responsible for conducting care and prevention planning, or it may be a combined prevention and care planning body in a city that receives Part A funds and direct CDC prevention funds. Um, and in St. Louis, San Diego, and Kansas City, for example, um, these are cities that don't receive direct CDC prevention funds, um, but have integrated prevention into the work of their, of their Ryan White planning bodies. So as you can see, there are a, a, a ton of sort of variations and iterations of this idea of um, just integrating or jointly conducting planning activities, um, but we hope that these general models sort of start to frame some of this for you. So I'm going to hand it over to Devin, and we're going to launch into a discussion of the actual stages of integrated planning. All right. Thanks, Molly. Um, so we've already covered a lot. Um, we've talked about what the purpose and benefits of integrated planning are, um, the difference between the integrated planning process and the integrated HIV prevention and care plan, what integrated planning means, and the different approaches that jurisdictions can take um, to integrated planning. So as Molly said, now it's time to kind of get into the action um, to talk about the stages of integrated planning. Integrated HIV prevention and care planning is a continuous process with five main stages that we have um, illustrated in this graphic on the slide in front of you. We want to highlight that integrated planning is ongoing and iterative, um, meaning that it's cyclical and lessons learned can feed into subsequent stages and hopefully inform improvements. It also means that jurisdictions do not necessarily start over in stage one, but rather can reorganize um, or update plans based on previous planning activities. Um, so you'll see that we have communicate and share progress as the fifth stage. And this is something that you actually should be doing throughout the entire cycle. You'll hear us mention this in almost every stage we talk about today. We've included it as its own stage here to emphasize how important this piece is to integrated planning. So we're going to jump into stage one, um, organize and prepare. So a successful planning process starts with reviewing a jurisdiction's current context um, to determine how to move forward. 
These initial tasks involve establishing collaborative relationships, garnering information about the communities served, and using relevant data to inform plan development. When establishing communication strategies, um, identify key stakeholders who are not already engaged from the outset, but who you think should be engaged, and establish an agreed upon documented structure and process to help guide the, this collaborative work. It's really helpful in this stage to identify and assign roles for developing the integrated plan. This can minify, minimize duplicated efforts, distribute the work, um, and make space for creative input. Establishing roles and responsibilities early on in this process can minimize confusion or any kind of miscommunication moving forward, and it can also help set some expectations of accountability for everybody involved in this process. In stage one, um, you really want to engage your stakeholders. You can do this by forming a planning committee or work group or convening an existing planning body to discuss the responsibilities and requirements for integrated planning and make recommendations for an overall approach to the planning process. Effective community engagement plays an essential role in this step. The goal of community involvement is to enhance coordination and collaboration um, and access to prevention care and and treatment services. Engaging the community from the start of the planning process strengthens their involvement and incorporation of their input in plan-related activities. Community stakeholders include people with personal and professional experience, expertise, or skills in HIV, such as people with HIV, HIV service providers, and others vulnerable to and affected by HIV. Particular consideration should really be given to historically underrepresented groups. Connect with stakeholders in settings and ways that are comfortable to them, and try to avoid falling back on conventional or out-of-date methods. These relationships that you're establishing here um, serve as the foundation for the planning process and provide direct insight into the community. So they're really essential. When we talk about meaningful stakeholder engagement, what is that? Um, meaningful Community engagement must be continuous, ongoing, and bi-directional. It must take into account the unique needs and challenges in each community. To do this, you need to exercise cultural humility, connect with diverse communities within a jurisdiction, and recognize that communities within a jurisdiction may, not, may require tailored engagement activities. So sort of like I mentioned on the last slide, um, you know, it's not one approach for everybody. Meaningful community engagement also consults a wide range of stakeholders and occurs in a variety of venues and formats um, and through various modalities to accommodate the needs and preferences of community members. This can include um, giving consideration to community involvement burden, the time of day and days of the week, and the geographic setting that this engagement takes place in. It also must um, occasionally take us out of our comfort zone to challenge conventional wisdom and encourage innovation. Um, so as we mentioned earlier, we know that, you know, COVID-19 has kind of turned everything on its head. Um, members of our IHAP team facilitated some recent discussions about community engagement during COVID-19, and we just wanted to share some of what we heard. In order to adapt to this new setting, engagement strategies that folks shared included an increased use of e-newsletters and stakeholder distribution lists, recording meetings, leaving notes on the agency's door for people who show up in person and may not be aware that the location is closed or not offering in-person services, connecting through people with connections, maximizing, you know, really maximizing existing communication networks. Um, to combat Zoom fatigue, folks scheduled more one-on-one -on -one meetings by phone. Um, people used COVID funding to increase infrastructure for virtual engagement, being flexible, getting community input in whatever way works best for them, providing brief TA videos, polling members to learn about internet and phone access, and conducting individualized training customized for people using laptop, laptops, desktops, and phones. We would really love to hear from y'all. Um, how are you engaging stakeholders during the COVID-19 emergency? We'd love to, to know how you've adjusted to this new reality that you know, everyone has had to adapt to pretty quickly. So feel free to chat um, 
some of your ideas in the chat. So how have you engaged stakeholders during the COVID-19 pandemic? And maybe some of them were, were on that last slide. Go back so you can look. Someone said virtual meetings. Yep, yep. Zoom meetings, online forums. They're really taking advantage of this virtual, new virtual space. Webinars, virtual trainings, random check-ins via phone. Oh, Uber Eats during long meetings. I like that. That's a creative idea. Lunchtime check-in. These are great. Yeah, COVID-19 has really inspired a whole new level of innovation, I think. Check-ins via Teams. Wonderful. Well, feel free to keep chatting those in. I'm going to move us on. Um, so continuing with these stage one activities, um, review existing data and collect new data. Integrated planning is a data-driven process that includes reviewing existing data, collecting new data, and analyzing and describing findings so they can be used to make decisions. Developing a plan to review and collect data involves the steps outlined on the slide here. Um, review the major integrated planning questions that the planning process is intended to answer. Determine what types of quantitative and qualitative data are needed to help answer the questions. Identify data priorities and gaps in existing data. Develop a plan for collecting and analyzing data. Gather and review existing data or secondary data, such as, epi I have a hard time with this word, such as epidemiologic data and other needs assessments for its usefulness for the integrated plan. As needed, adapt or develop and pilot test new data collection instruments. You can use surveys, interviews, focus groups, um, and other methods to collect new data. And then use existing data, use existing data sharing agreements or create new ones as needed. So through the needs assessment, jurisdictions collect and analyze information about the number, characteristics, and needs of people with HIV who are in and out of care and those vulnerable to HIV. Identify current resources available to meet identified needs and determine gaps in HIV prevention and care services. Jurisdictions should conduct a needs assessment every three to five years, monitor progress over time, and make annual adjustments as needed. As part of the needs assessment process, Jurisdictions develop an epidemiologic profile, which describes the sociodemographic, geographic, behavioral, and clinical characteristics of people with and communities vulnerable to HIV in the jurisdiction. The needs assessment also includes development of a resource inventory and assessment of provider and workforce capacity as a way to get a clear view of comprehensive service delivery. So as described here, needs assessment includes Needs assessments include the development of several pieces, an epidemiologic profile, a resource inventory, a profile of provider capacity and capability, an estimate and assessment of unmet need, an estimate and assessment of people with HIV who are unaware of their status, and an assessment of gaps in service needs. So then you're going to use all the data you've collected, both old and new data from the needs assessment, to describe successes and gaps in HIV prevention and care. Following data collection, review, analyze, and present data to help describe successes and gaps in the HIV prevention and care landscape in the jurisdiction. Not only will data drive the development of the integrated plan, but it will also establish a measurable starting point from which progress can be tracked and shared. To so identify individuals responsible for data analysis, review and analyze data, synthesize and format data so that planning committees and planning body, planning council members can understand the current state of HIV in the jurisdiction and identify themes and use the data for decision making. Create user-friendly visuals such as tables, charts, and graphics um, to help stakeholders interpret the data. And you can uh, create and use the HIV care continuum outcome data to highlight HIV prevention and care successes and gaps that can also inform plan development. So just like today where 
you know, we have a lot of different people here with different integrated planning experiences, as we saw from that, that um, poll. Um, you'll likely have work group members coming with different understandings of integrated planning. It's really important to get folks aligned, and a helpful way to do this is by providing orientation and training, especially on integrated planning development, on integrated plan development and the different components. Um, this is also a time to clearly define roles, responsibilities, and expectations. So we have a, a real-life example here of um, Pennsylvania developed an orient some orientation materials to help in the construction of their integrated plan. And central to orientation and getting everybody on the same page is establishing a shared language. Prevention and care staff may use different terminology or definitions for the same words or concepts. Broward County did this by creating a common lexicon. Um, you can also conduct a care and prevention crosswalk of key service definitions, data systems, and data points to help cross-train care and prevention staff. As we mentioned earlier, um, the IHAPTAC also has developed an online glossary of integrated planning terms. And it's included um, in the implementation section of the online resource guide. And I think that chat, that link should be available in the chat. So we've made it through stage one, and I'm going to pass it over to Molly to take you through stage two. Great. Thanks so much, Devin. So you've organized and prepared yourselves. So now moving into stage two, we will begin to prioritize activities and develop the plan. So with the available data that's been gathered and analyzed, uh, the Part A and or B recipient with their planning committees should um, move forward following the timelines and protocols um, that have already been sort of hashed out in that first stage to begin the process of um, outlining priorities and actually writing and developing the integrated HIV prevention and care plan. Um, so one thing, you know, we know that this isn't the only plan that you all are being asked to develop and, and the, the 2017 to 21 plan isn't the only one you've developed to date. So um, we really encourage you to reflect on your processes um, for developing other plans, such as the getting, any getting to zero plans or any of the epidemic um, plans that, <clears throat> excuse me, are in your jurisdiction and, and glean best practices and, and sort of maybe challenges you had um, and reflect on that process um, to move forward with the next iteration of the integrated planning process. And um, if possible, really we encourage jurisdictions to align, consider aligning um, these other plans with their integrated plan because doing so will really help to ensure consistency across goals and strategies and performance measures. Um, and that will really just increase um, and enhance the collaboration between health departments, community members, and stakeholders. And I do want to note before we dive too much into this, please go ahead and chat in any questions you have. Um, we've got a whole team here ready to answer them. Or um, any questions or anything you might like us to, to go back and review at the end if we have time. Um, so launching into the stage two activities, um, the first key activity is to structure the actual plan development process. So this includes developing timelines that account for draft development plus plus multiple rounds of, of review and revisions. Um, that's really important because you will be engaging, you should be engaging the community and stakeholders throughout and soliciting feedback. And so you want to give yourself the time to really take that in and then um, revise the plan as needed. Um, you also need to be referencing the federal guidance um, often and closely to ensure that you have all the necessary information in the plan um, and or that you have all the necessary information that you need to draft each of the required sections. Um, you should at the same time you are writing the plan, you should be also developing a monitoring plan. So a plan to um, monitor and, and improve the integrated plan which will ensure effective and responsive tracking of your progress and your successes. Um, and also, when possible, we really encourage folks to use technology um, as much as you can um, that would allow multiple parties to simultaneously view, edit, and contribute to the plan development. So something like Google Docs or Microsoft SharePoint, um, something along those lines of sort of collaborative um, writing and, and editing technology um, we've heard is very helpful. 
Throughout stage two, you'll also, um, like I said, continue to engage stakeholders and community members in the process. Um, and if you are using an external consultant to facilitate some of this work, really just make sure that the planning council members are fully and meaningfully engaged throughout the process. And it's also important to remember that you really should be engaging a range of stakeholders, not just those that are easily accessible or sort of obvious um, to engage on this work. Um, there may be great variation within a jurisdiction, including diverse focus populations and geographic aspects that require multiple and sort of tailored approaches. Um, and so be mindful of that when you are thinking about your engagement activities. And of course, um, as we've discussed and as Devin just really walked us through, now more than ever, it's very important to be flexible and innovative when planning how and where to solicit feedback. And so if it's not safe or appropriate to conduct an in-person meeting, just think through how you can use technology to facilitate a remote process. And um, if you do decide to host a virtual meeting, uh, you know, consider do all community members have access to computers, smartphones, reliable internet, all of these factors um, really must be taken into consideration and really sort of thoughtfully um, uh, approached um, and including the level of burden that's being placed on communities who are seeking to participate and provide feedback. Um, as Devin said, really the bottom line is that we really need to think outside of the box and be willing to try new things. Um, we look to Maryland, who has a great example of some, some great community engagement. So um, they, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, they solicited feedback from a variety of advisory groups, um, including state and city planning councils and committees, the MSM response team, the transgender response team, the HIV perinatal team, and the Maryland Hepatitis Coalition and STI Community Coalition. So that's a really wonderful um, sort of snapshot of very broad um, stakeholders all being brought into the planning process, um, which is really wonderful to see. Engaging the appropriate planning council or planning body um, really is a key step in developing the plan um, because this is the effective way to garner feedback from community representatives that can really guide you and make sure that your plan is, is that you're being, you know, that you're proposing and putting together feels doable and is actually relevant to what's happening on the ground. Um, and so this step is minimizing the likelihood that a plan is developed, but not at all reflective or responsive um, to the broader context of the community. And that's really the outcome that we are all trying to avoid. Um, so during this step, you'll want to present information to the planning council or planning body, usually, again, in an open meeting to which the public is invited, again, either in person or remotely. Um, and it's very important one sort of best practice is to provide copies or summaries of the plan to stakeholders um, beforehand, before the meeting, so that they can review and provide feedback um, either directly during a meeting or if they can't attend some other way, um, but giving folks the time to digest what you've put together and to really consider it um, instead of just asking them on, on the spot in a, in a meeting, you know, what they think. Um, that will solicit much more, um, I think, sort of thoughtful um, and helpful feedback. And then, of course, after receiving this feedback, you should go back to the table and review and revise uh, your integrated plan as necessary. And then, of course, the final integrated HIV prevention and care plan, that must be reviewed by the full planning council if um, you're working with the Part A. And that planning council is required. This is part of the, the formal sort of HRSA requirements with the integrated plan. That planning council is required to submit a letter of concurrence, concurrence with reservations, or no concurrence. So you will be engaging the Part A planning council in your jurisdiction um, throughout this process. And then lastly in stage two is, of course, uh, the work of disseminating the plan to all stakeholders um, and establishing mechanisms for sharing, plan, for sharing plan updates 
and your progress towards your goals and objectives with everyone. So one great way um, to approach this um, and was done in Wisconsin, for example, uh, they developed an abbreviated version of their plan, which distilled the 130-page 100, plan into a great 10-page document and then a one sort of at-a-glance document, which is, I think, one or two pages, um, that really just helps sort of um, hone in on the very the sort of big takeaways and the key uh, strategies and, and outcome measures. Um, and that is a really great way to communicate that, that communicate the plan and disseminate the plan to the community and also allowing them to be engaged in the process of the monitoring improvement too, which we'll talk about in a, in a few minutes. Um, so we've gone ahead and chatted out those links to those documents. And then also just a few other quick resources. Um, we also at IHAPTAC have um, compiled and posted the publicly available integrated HIV prevention and care plans. So the 2017 to 2021 plans, the ones that are publicly available are posted on our website. Um, and so we are also chatting out that link. And then finally, we also um, identified um, as a project, we identified exemplary sections of plans um, and included them in our online resource guide. So this list is not exhaustive, um, but does sort of pull out and highlight some some really strong examples um, that jurisdictions put together of the required sections. Um, and these would be perhaps helpful um, for you to take a look at as you are looking to develop or revise sections of your integrated plans for the upcoming um, planning cycle. So I'm gonna send it back over to Devin, who's gonna walk us through stage three, which is implementing the plan. All right, so we know that implementing um, integrated plan activities can feel maybe daunting and that progress can seem really hard to achieve. Um, but as you begin to put your integrated plan into action, um, we ask that you consider the following activities to help establish a streamlined, organized, and clear implementation process. For stage three, it's really helpful to document your process. For each activity assigned to one entity, um, you'll wanna confirm who will be responsible for the activity to ensure that it's completed. Establishing these pieces at this point will minimize confusion as you move further into the implementation process. This requires identifying individual roles and responsibilities for assigned tasks and activities communicating protocols to support implementation and mechanisms to share progress and challenges, identifying measures, data sources, and data collection processes, and reporting structures. Um, for joint activities that require collaboration across the program, you're gonna to wanna to describe roles and responsibilities of each entity to support collaborative activities, communication protocols to support implementation and mechanisms to share progress and challenges, decision-making process and, final, and the final decision-maker, policies and procedures to implement decisions, measures, data sources, and data collection processes, and reporting structures. So between the, the joint activities that require collaboration across programs and the one entity, the, act, the activities are kind of similar, but you'll note that the joint activities just require um, a couple additional steps to make sure that communication is happening and and things are clear to everybody involved. So um, having a list on hand um, that helps frame activities as action steps can bring the jurisdiction progressively closer to goals and objectives. The action steps can generate momentum and help structure regular updates to key stakeholders as you implement your plan. And what we have here is a, um, a really great example of what Arizona created to help them track um, progress of metrics. So the spreadsheets that you see include overall goals, smart objectives, task status updates, a detailed description of each task, performance metrics, who's involved, and the start and end date for each task. So it gets really specific um, 
about you know who who's responsible and when this is going to get done and that can just help keep you on track as you implement your plan and now we're going to go back to molly for stage four great thanks Devin. so um, as we've talked about uh, it's it's critically important to be monitoring and improving the plan as you're implementing the integrated plan so um, creating an actionable plan helps an actionable, actionable monitoring and improvement plan helps your jurisdiction um, keep on track and also demonstrate success and document ongoing barriers or challenges that you can um, that you can address. So uh, we initially referred to the integrated planning process as an iterative and cyclical process. Um, and this is really sort of where this shows up. So as you begin to monitor your integrated plan, you may start to recognize things about this plan that you may have overlooked during its development. And so now is the time to make adjustments as you need. Um, and reviewing and revising the monitoring plan as you go um, will help ensure that the plan is responsive and again, aligned with the current landscape of integrated plan implementation. Um, and also will give you the opportunity to revisit um, and adjust if you need your, the measures and data sources, data collection process, and your reporting structures and processes. Um, and then of course, in doing so, in implementing the monitoring plan, what you're doing is assessing the implementation of the goals and the SMART objectives and projected activities that were written into the integrated plan. And then throughout this process, there we go, you'll also be updating stakeholders on what you found throughout your monitoring um, process. So really best practice is to share the data as well as the conclusions um, that, you may have, that you may have gleaned, conclusions that um, partners may have gleaned also from their data, and then present that, again, in a format that allows people to, um, to understand what they're looking at and to provide feedback. Um, and then, of course, um, throughout, uh, you can be using all of this feedback as well to be updating your integrated plan accordingly, too. So this really is an ongoing um, process where you are revising, you're re reviewing and revising continuously. And then lastly, you can use HIV care continuum data and real-time data dashboards to monitor progress. So for example, um, you can be identifying, um, you should identify the appropriate care continuum data and related sources and determine a plan and routine time to review surveillance program and care data. Use data to measure changes related to the HIV care continuum and also consider quality improvement approaches such as um, rapid cycle improvement if that's something that your health department or organization may use. Um, so with that, we're nearing the end. I'm gonna hand it back over to Devin who's gonna walk us through stage five, which is communicate and share progress. Um, and then that will sort of wrap up our five steps of integrated planning. All right, y'all, we've made it to stage five. Um, and in case, we haven't said it enough already, stakeholder engagement is essential throughout the entire planning process. Um, but this fifth and final stage builds on previous activities to share information about integrated plan implementation and progress with key stakeholders and communicate with broader audiences as appropriate. So in this stage, jurisdictions have the opportunity, opportunities to synthesize data and present information in the most appropriate format based on the needs of the audience. Jurisdictions may develop infographics, other visuals, and briefs tailored to community key messages and progress to diverse groups or partners. Um, and just, you know, like we mentioned earlier, sharing updates and progress with stakeholders is an essential activity through all the five stages to ensure that your plan accurately reflects what's happening on the ground. That said, in this stage, we focus on how you can share updates and progress. It's important to update and share integrated plan implementation progress regularly with planning bodies and other stakeholders. Communication on plan progress includes highlighting successes, identifying challenges in implementation, and recommending modifications to plan activities. You can do this by creating a progress report or activity dashboard that's updated and shared regularly according to an established schedule. 
Um, you can distill the integrated plan and its activities into a, a succinct visual or snapshot to promote or communicate progress. Um, and we have examples of documents and other visuals that you can you know, use to share with stakeholders about plan activities and tasks. So for example, um, when Wisconsin first developed their integrated plan, they developed an abbreviated overview to describe the plan. That's what you see on the left. And in 2019, they released a progress report to share updates on implementation of their integrated plan. Both of these resources are in our online resource guide um, that you can find in the chat and on our website. Um, so these resources plus several more tools and tips to support process, um, to support the process of integrated HIV prevention and care planning um, are all available on the IHAPTAC page on the Target HIV site. And finally, we want to touch on some of the tools and resources available for jurisdictions to guide their integrated planning efforts and implementation of their integrated plans. Um, we maintain an online resource guide and continue to add to it as we develop new tools or identify new resources in different jurisdictions. So we're really excited to share the upcoming launch of an online curriculum all about integrated planning. Um, so this module called Integrated Planning 101 serves as an introduction to the fundamentals of integrated planning and is designed for anyone who is new to integrated HIV, HIV prevention and care planning or anyone who would like a refresher on the basics. So hopefully this helps um, with, with some of the stages that, that y'all find most challenging. Please feel free to contact us um, about any additional resources you may be looking for or targeted TA. And um, we thank you again. We know everyone's very busy um, and anxious about uh, next round of integrated planning. So I appreciate your time today. Um, as a reminder, please fill out the evaluation. I'll pop out in a moment. And please contact us if you have any additional questions or looking for any resources. Thank you and have a great afternoon.